Hello. How many of you knows how the Latin talkie works? You are great guys. We'll, we'll summarize very fast because we, I want to go deep in the content. So, uh, we have uh, five great presentations, uh, 30 minutes to have fifth time the understanding of one single talk. Less boring, very fast, great content, great presenters. So each 15 seconds, one slide, uh, auto advancing slide. The guys are very nervous. Please clap your hands for them to encourage them. Thank you, you are great. So don't waste, I don't want to waste time. Let's start from Jason and enjoy the presentation. Jason, please. Thank you. I will start in... Uh... Okay, when you are ready, click yes. the button and then you can start. Okay. Can't forget this. Perfect. Hi, uh, my name is Jason Jolly. I work with a company called MicroStrategies based in the Northeast in the US. Um, and today, I want to talk about um, using AI to help your alfresco solutions a bit better. Um, so my goal here today is really to help all of you get a, a brief intro to AI um, and how you can use it within alfresco to make your life easier and your users' lives easier. Now to do that, first we want to talk about what it means, cognition, what is, what is cognitive. So these are all the kinds of things that we, we all know every day. I mean, we all have understanding, we hear, we see, we have emotion, we make decisions. So it's interesting to think about that. When, that, when, you, when you think about that in terms of cognitive services, well, cognitive services, cognitive computing, really just tries to emulate human cognition. So it tries to pretend to be a computer. It tries to, to make the same kind of decisions or the same kind of rules. So what about Alfresco? Well, Alfresco has content. Alfresco is really good at all these kinds of things, processes, governance, insights, etc. But if you want to take that and make it a little bit smarter, how do you do that? Well, you take the cognitive services that, uh, that are out there and kind of merge it with Alfresco. Um, now, I highlighted one here called natural language processing because this is kind of the root of everything that's out there. Um, so when you look at video and audio, et cetera, it, a lot of it comes back to that. And that's really how do you understand language. Um, think about Alexa or Google Home, how it takes the text you have and then it puts it uh, into some kind of context that can use it. All the major vendors support the, all of these services, um, but then there's a lot of niche players out there too that you can leverage in your solutions. So we take that and we think about the cognitive patterns with Alfresco. There's some simple ones, metadata enhancement, so you can stop filling in forms, you can have it automatically populate these values, you can categorize the content, move it to the correct location, you can even have cognitive media viewers that can display it. Um, from a building block standpoint, to build these things, I want to go over how to do that. And here's an example for APS, a REST call task. This is your lower barrier to entry. You can use this to interact with any of these RESTful services down below um, and be able to do more with activity. You can also take it a step further and build service classes, then build Java delegates and task listeners on top of that. And, and that's what you can use in your workflow processes to do something really complex. Um, and you can do a lot with that. But then you can take it a step further. You can build your stencils so that your users can build the workflows with this functionality built in it. You can also build it into the UI so that your users can take these components and have it available um, and in the user interface itself. Now let's talk about ACS and the same kind of thing. You're going to have a common service layer, but then you also need a custom model to be able to hold all this data that you're taking out of, of the content, um, make it available. But if you really want to make it available, you need an action executor class to make this, this knowledge public to the rest of your application. And, and this can be used within rules to make it very easy to hook up into anything that you're doing. Um, you can also use the REST API to make it exposed to your external clients or ADF. Then you can also do one other step and build it into the UI. And this is great when you have cognitive components that have a UI built in already, and we'll see some of that in this talk, that you can embed that in those components. So when we talk about those, those kinds of processes and how we're taking these building box, blocks and put it together, the simplest model is metadata enhancement. Um, so we can have a rule on a folder that calls an action and then just puts the document inside uh, Alfresco with the model up to date. And that's just cause, calling a natural language understanding or processing service. 
to categorize content. It's a bit more complex because we have all types of content here, media, um, audio, et cetera, but still the same idea, update the model, move it into whatever folder you want or categorize it with categories and tags. The last one I want to go through is media viewing. It's very similar to content categorization, but in the end, you're taking it and, and getting it ready to display so that you can update the user interface with some more data on, on how this uh, uh, cognitive data about these videos and media. So this is a quick video. I'm uploading a video. Um, and then there's an action down below uh, this to open a smart viewer. So this is a, a talk that John Newton did, or a video, called The Future of Work. And you can see the different faces in the video. You can see, you can click on places where he shows up in the video to see what he's doing. Um, you can see the transcript, and it'll auto-scroll with the transcript. And this is just me uploading. Um, I can also do searches, and I put in the number 10. I can see 10 years uh, all throughout here. I put in 2020, and I can see where 2020 shows up. And I could click any one of these pieces and go straight to the place in the video. Um, the other thing I can do is I can actually use the translation service and go to Portuguese. And now it'll show all of the transcript and all the insights in Portuguese. So you can see all these keywords that were taken out, annotations, the sentiment below. All of this information is now automatically shown in that language. And I can scroll through the transcript in, in that language. And I didn't have to do any work, really, for this. This is just calling other components. Thank you very much. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Gradeshek, and I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a framework I did uh, a long time ago, uh, which is called Alfresco MVC. Mainly, actually, it's uh, an integration of, of, uh, of Spring MVC on the Alfresco repository side. So I have a quite long uh, experience in Alfresco. I'm, I'm, I'm young, but <laughs> it's uh, 12 years uh, and uh, a bit more. And I really love Alfresco, but what I don't like inside is the web scripts. They, they make really life uh, hard, in my opinion, especially for developers. Because every time we create a new web script, when we want a new um, API, actually, like a REST service, we need to create a lot of files like Descriptor, XML, FTLs, JavaScripts, uh, Java controllers, etc. So uh, actually, there is really a lot of configuration, in my opinion, which, with time, it uh, becomes very difficult to, to change and to maintain. And I'm not even talking about unit tests. So what if we could do something like this instead of a web script, but that we stay inside of Alfresco, we stay inside the web script lifecycle, but we use uh, Spring MVC controllers. And when, whenever we want, we have normal JSON back, because that's actually what we as developers want. At least that's what I want. Huh? And uh, so very often, you know, people when they start with uh, uh, web, web script, sorry, they have a really difficult time. So uh, Fresco MVC is a, a set of three independent libraries, REST, AOP, and Query Template. So I'll talk about each of them because they solve different issues. Uh, so mea culpa first, because uh, the Alfresco MVC dispatcher for REST is actually a web script. <laughs> so that's uh, my bad. But that's the main entry point. So by default, it's, uh, it's configured to Alfresco slash service slash MVC. Everybody will uh, recognize that. And all it does, it takes the rest of the, of the URL and all the parameters, so the request, and transfer to, to uh, Spring um, uh, Dispatcher Servlet. Actually, we have a new context, which is the Servlet context. I'm sure all the developers are aware of that. So how to use it? So we could use Java config or XML config. So it's completely integrated inside of Alfresco in the application context and all that. And the server context, you know, uh, it's a child context. So uh, later on, we just write normal Spring controllers. When we need the new REST API, we just write request mapping. Do we want to use POST or GET or whatever? And uh, of course, because we are in the Spring, we have Spring interceptors and all the Spring MVC stack. Uh, regarding testing, so since we use Spring MVC and, uh, and the controllers, we could use MVC mock. We could then use also Spring REST docs, Swagger, to create a documentation. It could be quite easy. Uh, the next part I want to talk about is uh, just a helper. It's a, a si three simple annotation to create uh, transactions, uh, authentication, and uh, run as. So that's something 
everybody is doing, uh, I guess, uh, almost every day, so when we do, so I'm talking about such a code. So when we need to write a run as, we need to create uh, quite a lot of boilerplate, in my opinion, while it could just be a simple annotation. So those annotations uh, are very easy, so they, they come, so you can use that without uh, Spring MVC or, uh, sorry, uh, Alfresco MVC, yeah? or just uh, this part like AOPM. You could put that on services or on controllers, simply. Uh, the last part actually of the framework is a query template, so bear in mind uh, that uh, that's just a tape safe query, that's just a, a, a simple uh, helper. It's like an object relationship mapping for Alfresco nodes also. It was inspired uh, from a, a Spring JDBC template. And now if you wonder if people use it, yes. I, I, I know of dozens of companies, dozen, dozen, <laughs> almost 10, uh, small and large, and I, I know a couple of freelancers that use it. And should you use it? In my, in my opinion, this should be uh, um, standard in Alfresco, so everybody actually should use that way and no, no web script. Huh? Uh, so when, when, when you should use it, whenever you need to write a new web script, so I'm talking about custom APIs, because what I build is just custom applications uh, uh, on top of Alfresco, of course, huh? and that brings a faster development uh, in, in your life, <laughs> and then I think you, you would be a happier developer, I hope. Uh, so th this, uh, in order to use it, is distributed on Maven Central. So you have three jars. You could uh, include them in your, your project. Uh, there is a couple of um, uh, samples that you can find on my GitHub, uh, GitHub repository. And if ever you want to find out more, you check the GitHub page or ping me. I'm also hanging out on uh, IRC. My nickname is D. Gradechak. <laughs> so feel free. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is uh, Mohamed Ghazal. I work as a premier service engineer for Alfresco. I'm going to uh, talk about PDF template, which is basically used to extract data from PDF documents. So some of the um, use cases um, the customer was interested in is they wanted specific data from PDF documents. So full text search was not practical for them. Similarly, uh, depending upon the data, they wanted to execute different workflow steps. Um, <clears throat> So the solution which we came up with was to have a PDF template which actually facilitate automatic extraction and storage of specific metadata as defined by a template. It allows users to declare areas or regions of a PDF template to be a source location for a key value pair. So whenever future PDF documents are uploaded to Alpha Content Services, the text in the document which, is, which, which appears in the specified rectangular regions are added as document metadata. So this, this makes, basically confirms that PDF has to be conformed to that particular template. So this is just a flow diagram. The template setup is an add-on on top of Acrobat, uh, Adobe Acrobat. So you open a PDF document, you specify the regions declared by the user, then they select a, uh, select a key, uh, key name for those uh, regions. And then once that done, the template is saved into Alpha School Content Services, and from when you save it, it triggers a content, mod content model automatically. Uh, then once you, you create a rule for a particular folder, and once you upload the PDF documents to that folder, its metadata is automatically extracted and saved as a property. So this is an example, um, uh, Adobe Acrobat plugin UI. So if you notice, the user has already selected the regions, and the data types which are supported are alphanumeric, number, date, date time, and table data type. So this is an example, uh, a template XML content which is saved into content services. We are in basically interested in the key name and its data type. Um, so we take for the normal ones and the table as a different structure. So we, we create the content model by taking this information. So this is the uh, share UIs, uh, a custom content model user interface. Uh, the, the key names are listed here. If you notice, the tables uh, data type are multi-valued while others are not. So this is the web script that is actually called from the Acrobat add-on. Most of them are self-explanatory except for update. 
uh, as the content model, you cannot delete a keys from a content model. We are actually, we create a new content model and then we update the association of the template to the new content model. Um, uh, this is the, uh, some of the model APIs which we call, we actually use the custom model services APIs. Um, uh, for, uh, for deleting a model, we have to first actually deactivate the model and then only after commit, we actually delete the model. So if we, if for, similarly for uh, model in use, uh, there was no an API in, cust uh, in the model, uh, there was no proper API, so we had to use uh, the model validators can delete model. Similarly for get custom model, we had to use custom models, get custom model method. So this is a highly customized rule page where the user can only select the, this particular apply PDF template rule and they can select multiple, um, um, multiple templates. And this, the action actually runs asynchronously. So this is the custom action which is called from the rule. Uh, it actually calls an external web script, a web service actually. Uh, and this is the response what we get from the web service, the JSON response, the thing which you are interested in, the, it's the name and its value. So we save this name and value as uh, metadata. So this is the uh, action parameter. This is the bean ID which, which is called. And uh, uh, the example uh, shows up uh, the, the list of the template names which we see in the rule page. Um, this is an example node browser. Once you upload the PDF document to the folder, uh, the values are extracted. And if you notice the concert ticket extractor XML, which is another template, this particular PDF template, uh, sorry, this particular PDF document does not conform to that template, so we don't have any values uh, for that particular template. So uh, as the action is executed asynchronously, the, the extraction can fail. So there is a customized admin user interface where the user can select for resubmit to, for the extraction. So this is the Lucene query which we use uh, to get the, uh, the, uh, the nodes which, which are being extracted. Uh, Alfresco has an action tracking service which tells if the nodes is uh, currently being executed. So we can use that particular uh, code to, um, uh, to ignore those nodes. Similarly, you can have an asynchronous queue. Uh, and you, this particular example code gives us the nodes which are in queue. So we can ignore those also to show up in the uh, failed, uh, failed uh, list. So this is a highly customized uh, search interface where you can search for specific keys. Um, uh, from templates, you can select more than one particular key to search. Uh, you can use AND or any, any operations to, for the search purpose. So some of the references which we used, um, the Java API reference which and the, for custom action we used an example and also currently uh, Alfresco's custom model APIs are not public so uh, we have a couple of JIRAs to make sure that they make it public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jasper Hilven. It's uh, not Hilton, uh, as you could have read. Uh, I'm not a brother of Paris or anything. I'm uh, Jasper Hilven. So uh, I work at uh, Xenet Solutions. And today I'm going to talk about how to get things done uh, fast by using uh, React and TypeScript. Um, we have developed a Xenet uh, product. It's called the Alfred Finder. Uh, by using these techniques, and I'll, I will show it to you uh, in the way. So what is it all about? I will talk about uh, the product a little bit. I will talk about uh, React and fi um, TypeScript. I will talk about other technologies, and also about how we try to keep uh, things simple to ensure our uh, quality. So this is how the Finder looks like. It's a web application. Uh, it allows you to actually find uh, documents. Uh, it has multiple components, as you can see. We have uh, auto-completion, we have a facet panel, we have a metadata panel, and here you see the finder again. Uh, but it's for uh, a specific customer, so we customized it uh, for ETHIAS, it's a big insurance company. Um, and yeah, uh, they really love it because yeah, we customize it the way that they actually want it. Um, I also want to talk about software architecture. And um, I think the most important thing about uh, software architecture is understanding the problem domain and the solution domain. So that means you should develop all your abstractions and things around these things. And for the rest, you should keep your architecture as simple as possible. And why simple and small? Because if things are simple, you understand them. And if you things you understand, there are probably less bugs. And if there are less bugs, you can also make it faster. What we not want is we don't want a very uh, complicated framework, which is more than two megabytes uh, big which uh, has some kind of crazy dependency in section that you cannot debug, which has some kind of crazy uh, contra flow that you don't understand. So that's why we choose to use React. 
And uh, React is just a library, and you say to React, look, here is my uh, some kind of small uh, data model, some kind of small JavaScript object, and you pass it to it, and it renders your application. And the beautiful thing about React is it's just JavaScript. As you can see, this is actually production code, and yeah, it just uh, functions. You see some strings in here, you see some uh, JavaScript objects, nothing more. And that's also the way how our components grow is in a natural way. They, we don't start with making five files for a single component. No, a component starts being a value. If you reuse it, you make it a variable. If you need some scope, you give it. Uh, you can make a function or even a class. At Xenet, we have multiple customers, and therefore we also have multiple projects for the finder. We also have um, um, projects for, uh, for example, for the UI. And to manage all these projects, we use uh, NPM. So NPM allows us to reference to uh, multiple sub-projects by also pinpointing a specific version. And the great thing about NPM is that it's, it just works, actually. Um, we try to ensure that there is enough quality in our product. So we try to have quality at multiple levels of our product. And the first level of quality is at the level of code. So and to ensure that we don't make stupid uh, errors, we use a type checker, and therefore we use the language uh, TypeScript. Now, TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript with, uh, yeah, with types on it, uh, that's it. And we also use a TypeScript as lint. It's a linter for TypeScript, so that all the developers uh, write the same style, uh, which makes everything easier. So this is how TypeScript looks like. Uh, top level, you can see it, it almost just looks like JavaScript, nothing more. But you can make it as complex and over-engineered as you want. For example, and here you can see, you could have seen, <laughs> uh, really complex uh, type uh, typing system things. So the second level of uh, code quality uh, is uh, quality at component level because you can have uh, components that compile, but that doesn't mean that they actually uh, work. Therefore, we use unit tests. We use uh, Jasmine, which describes uh, how the unit test should look like. And we use Enzyme, which actually allows you to test uh, the things that come out of React. So you can really test your UI. The third level of quality we introduce um, is the fact that, I mean, you can have working unit tests and you can have uh, compiling code, but it doesn't mean that your application actually works. And that's why we have integration tests for our user stories. And to facilitate that, we use uh, Selenium technology and uh, browser stack. Now, what is Selenium? Selenium automates your integration testing um, for, yeah, for all your user stories. And Broister Stack is a company that allows you to do that on, yeah, for example, 60 different types of browsers so that all the customers are happy. In the end, you have your quality, but it needs to run on somewhere, so one place, on which everybody can agree on, yes, it works, or no, the build is broken, and that's Jenkins. So uh, we use Jenkins for all the company. And um, yeah, we, I think we really love uh, Mr. Jenkins because we, we, we all agree on whether something works or something doesn't work, and uh, it's always good to agree, of course. Uh, so that was it. Uh, I hope to see you at the Xenet Boot for a quick uh, demo of our product, and uh, thank you very much for listening. So that's my turn now. I'm Charles from uh, Amexio, and I'm a proud member of Order of the Bee. Today, uh, this morning, I will talk about an alternative way in order to explore our documents. But first of all, let's talk about uh, some, someone I know really well, or Maybe pretty well. That's myself. And myself, uh, the, the big round in the, in the middle, um, of the lives uh, split in two parts. One is uh, my job at Amexio. The other one are my two wonderful daughters. They're wonderful, they're really clever, and they're interesting on what I'm doing. That's not an easy question to answer when, when you are a dad. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I scratch my head. I can tell her that I'm having fun with my team, I'm drinking coffee, and sometimes beers also, and uh, that I'm playing around with our fresco, doing some sort of crazy things, um, talking for the first time in English, uh, in a lightning talk. Uh, but I must find something a bit more serious. So uh, I take a, a face, a strong face, and I say, I'm helping people to find the right document when they need it. Good, now. That's my job as an ECM consultant. It's not easy to understand for her. So I say, 
I take a bunch of documents and I try to organize them. Like you do in your, in your room. You uh, put your, your toys in a drawer in order to, uh, to have a more clean room. But it's not so easy when you are an ECM consultant. You can't put all the documents in the drawer and, and shut off the drawer. You have to, uh, to construct some types, define some properties, create some folder trees, and sometimes when you can't, you, you define some smart folders or associations. That's our job. We have to scratch a lot our, our heads too. And when we have done our, our work, uh, the customer are already happy because they can find their document using various, um, various ways. They can use a search engine with advanced search form. They can browse the folder tree or even use uh, some smart folders. They can use uh, filters uh, that are available in, uh, in share. But there is a problem for me. Our customer lacking freedom and context. And you know that because you uh, heard uh, John uh, this morning, context is really important when you want to explore to uh, use your data. Our customers uh, do not have choice of the form. They do not have choice of folder trees. And uh, the search results are put, but uh, you don't have the context of the document when you see a long list of documents in the search results. And so uh, I'm trying to find a new way to give freedom to our customer to help them to explore their documents in context. And uh, that's why um, I work on a new interface uh, that is mainly based on graph. Each node on the graph is a document. Each edge on the graph is a relation. And the relation can be, uh, I don't know, some tags that are shared between the document, some values of the properties that, that um, match between the documents. And with a, a graph approach, you can see some clusters of documents appear that are documents that are um, that are next uh, to each other, and you can find some, um, some interesting information. How does it work? You start from a node, and you click the Explore action in a IADF. Everything starts with a single node. Yeah, that's, a, that's not so much. But when you click that node, you have a pop-up that helps you choose the properties or the tags or even the association you want to, uh, to explore and you create a graph with uh, the documents that are relevant and that uh, are uh, fine with the search engine. And uh, there is an example of what we can achieve using uh, some, uh, some photos and some tags. Uh, when I explore Lisbon, I have a, a cluster of, uh, of documents and then I can dig through uh, the, uh, the documents. Uh, a graph can rapidly be uh, a real mess, so you need to be able to uh, emphasize some uh, nodes of some parts of your graph. Uh, you also um, need to know what are the relation between two nodes, two documents, and the age uh, tells you what is the relation, either properties or, or tags or a mix of both of them. Of course, this is um, a prototype, uh, the, the, uh, I have lots of work to do in order to create a perfect tool, but with a ADF, it's pretty easy to, uh, to develop and to add more and more function functionalities. If you want to see this application working on the touch screen uh, computer, uh, please come by myself and uh, I will show you how it works and how it's uh, easy with a touch screen to explore your documents. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Final clap for all the speakers that have been great. Did you like the talks? Okay, thank you very much for being here. The Hackathon Showcase after that, and then uh, please check on the program for the rest of the talks. Thank you, have a nice day.